What is Byzantine Fault Tolerance, or BFT for short? The concept of Byzantine Fault Tolerance is confusing to many people, not just beginners. Even the name Byzantine Fault Tolerance is very confusing, so, before we explain it, let's quickly go over an imaginary story to understand where this name comes from. A very very long time ago, there was an empire called the Byzantine Empire, and it was a very strong military force. Imagine that there were four groups of the Byzantine army surrounding an enemy city. One of the four groups is led by a commander, and the other three groups are led by three lieutenant generals. For the Byzantine army to win, these generals need to come to an agreement on a common war plan, either to attack at the same time or retreat at the same time. So, they can all decide to attack or decide to retreat and attack at another time. What they choose here doesn't matter that much, what matters is that they reach an agreement on one decision. So, let's say that the commander issued an order to attack. The generals are distant from each other and can communicate only by sending messengers with messages. So, the commander will send three written messages to the other three generals with the order to attack. To make sure that everyone is on the same page, each one of the three lieutenant generals will send to the other generals what the commander told him to do. The problem here is that there may be some traitors, which are generals bribed by the city to try and prevent the other loyal generals from reaching agreement on one decision. So, for example, if there is one traitor general, which is Lieutenant Two, he will send for the other two lieutenants and say that the commander told him to retreat. On the other hand, the loyal Lieutenant Three will send to the loyal Lieutenant One that the commander told him to attack, and also Lieutenant One will tell Lieutenant Three the commander told him to attack. In this situation, from the perspective of Lieutenant One, he got two attack messages and only one retreat message from the traitor, which is Lieutenant Two. So he will take the majority vote and decides to attack with Lieutenant Three and the commander. The situation is the same from the perspective of Lieutenant Three. He also got two attack messages and one retreat message, so he will also decide to attack. In this example, the commander is loyal, so he should attack at the same time with his generals. So, at the end, in this example, the commander and the two loyal lieutenants all attacked, so the one traitor could not prevent them from reaching the agreement on the attack decision. But what if there was two traitors? For example, Lieutenant 3 was also bribed with Lieutenant 2. In this situation, the two traitors will try and prevent the loyal commander and the loyal Lieutenant 1 from reaching agreement on one decision. So, for example, if the commander issued an order to attack and sent three attack orders to the three lieutenants, then, the two traitor lieutenants will try to confuse the loyal lieutenant one. So, they will send messages saying that the commander told them to retreat. From the perspective of lieutenant one, he got two retreat messages and one attack message from the commander. The problem here is that he doesn't know who the traitors are, so he will think that the commander is a traitor and he is sending me to my death alone. So, he will take the majority vote and retreat. The commander on the other hand also, doesn't know who the traitors are and what they are doing, so, he will do what he told the lieutenants to do and he will attack alone. In this situation, the loyal lieutenant retreated alone and the loyal commander attacked alone. So the two traitors actually succeeded in preventing them from reaching agreement on one decision. So the point to take from here is that for the loyal generals to reach agreement on a decision, the total number of generals needs to be more than three times the number of traitors. Put another way, the number of traitors can exceed one-third the number of all generals. So, for example, if there are four generals, one traitor won't prevent the other three loyal lieutenants from reaching agreement on a decision. But if there are two traitors, the two loyal lieutenants won't be able to reach this agreement, as two is more than third of the four generals. So, what if there are seven generals? Well, two traitors won't prevent the loyal five lieutenants from reaching agreement. But three traitors or more can prevent agreement. You may be thinking, what do these generals have to do with blockchains or crypto? Well, first before we continue, if you have been enjoying the video so far, hit the like button, it really supports the channel. So, what we explained is a problem called the Byzantine General's Problem, it was created to discuss how decentralized networks can reach agreement on a decision. So, what does that mean? You may know that any blockchain is a distributed ledger, which simply means a list of accounts, balances, and transactions. This list is distributed, meaning that it is stored on many computers all around the world, which means that each computer can have a different version of this list, and there is no central authority to make changes to it and make sure that transactions are recorded correctly. 
So all these computers all around the world need to reach agreement on the correct version and the transactions recorded in their order. To reach this agreement, something called a consensus mechanism is used, and there are a lot of consensus mechanisms like proof of work and proof of stake. You may already know some of them. But the problem here is that these computers all around the world act like the generals in our story. So there are some malicious computers trying to prevent the other computers from reaching agreement. These malicious computers are equivalent to the traders in our story. So, returning back to the name Byzantine Fault Tolerance, a Byzantine fault is when a computer is malicious and spreading wrong information to other computers, or even when a computer is offline and not sending any information at all. This malicious or offline computer here is called a Byzantine node. Don't be confused with the word node, node means a computer. So it may start getting clear now, the Byzantine fault tolerance concept means the ability of a network to continue working correctly and reach agreement. Even when there are some Byzantine faults, which simply mean malicious or offline computers. The tolerance level of a blockchain is measured by how many malicious computers it can have and still reach agreement on the process transactions. You may hear that a network or a blockchain has Byzantine fault tolerance when it can continue working correctly, even if up to 33% of all computers are malicious or offline. Of course, some networks can tolerate more than 33%, but it depends on the consensus mechanism used. For example, in proof of work, there are a lot of powerful computers and hardware devices connected to the network to process transactions. In Bitcoin, the network can actually tolerate up to 50% of the computing power of all computers to be malicious or offline and still continue working correctly. Proof of stake blockchains also have Byzantine fault tolerance to varying degrees. It all depends on how the network is designed. But we won't get deeper into that as it can get very complicated. Now you know what is Byzantine fault tolerance. But a very similar term you will hear is practical Byzantine fault tolerance. Many people confuse it with the Byzantine fault tolerance we just explained, but they are actually two different things. Practical Byzantine fault tolerance is a consensus mechanism used to reach agreement between the computers on the network, just like other consensus mechanisms like proof of work and proof of stake. It was based on the research done on the Byzantine generals problem we explained earlier. That is why it was given that name. But the Byzantine fault tolerance on the other hand is a property or an attribute of a blockchain or a network, like how many malicious or offline computers the network can have and still reach agreement. We will actually make a video on the practical Byzantine fault tolerance mechanism and how it works as it is pretty confusing. At the end of this video, we really hope you learned what you need to know about Byzantine fault tolerance. And if you liked our video, hit the like button, let us know in the comments if you have any questions and subscribe to our channel and turn on the notifications so you don't miss our new videos. Thanks for watching.